Okay. Oh, I did it. Good afternoon to all of you in the Europass Academy community. I am so sorry that we had a little problem with the volume, and but I solved the problem. And uh, thanks also to our marketing team. I am so happy to be here for our um, Euro weekly Europass talk. And hey. oh, oh so, I and did of course, it. I also Good have myself. Yes. Talk. And my name is Susan Galliano. I am a professional counselor and educator, and I am a head teacher trainer here at Europass. So let's see here. I see that some of you are starting to arrive, and I would love to know where you are watching us from. Please uh, let me know where you are. Uh, our teacher community, uh, a lot of our teachers are coming from the European Union, but we are very happy to see that over time, our community has also extended to uh, the Americas, to Africa, to uh, many parts of Asia, um, and um, also to um, even Oceania sometimes. So hello, everyone. And I am, let's see, I see that someone has arrived from Florence. Please take a moment to just let us know where you're from so I can make sure I say hello. Oh, yeah, there's Stefania from Romania. Yes. And hello from Bulgaria. It's very nice to see you. I'm so happy to be here. I hope everyone's having a good week so far because, uh, yes, hello from Italy. It's um, really been, uh, it's been an interesting time these last couple of weeks here in Italy. And we're uh, actually really looking forward to um, next week. I should be having a face-to-face -face course here in Florence with some lovely teachers from France and Spain. And I couldn't be more excited. Oh, and then we have someone from Portugal. And it looks like we even have someone from New Jersey. So that's really exciting all around the world. So thank you for being with us. Mm, today, our talk is going to focus on what are called the four C's of 21st century learning. Now, if you've followed any of my talks before, you've probably seen that um, I talk a lot about this topic because I find it really exciting. I find it uh, very motivating. Um, so before we jump in, let me ask you a question. For any of you who are joining us now, please uh, feel free to write in the chat box where you are watching us from. And I'm going to ask all of you a question. And even if you watch this later after we have recorded, I would still like for you to participate in this because I'm going to be keeping an eye on the chat box and responding uh, for a few days now. So, um, I wanted to know, oh, someone's coming from Greece. Hello, Anastasia. And I wanted to ask each one of you, when you hear the four C's, okay, so the four C's is, are made up of communication, collaboration, creativity, and critical thinking. So when you hear these four words, I would love to hear from each one of you, don't be shy, which one of these words jumps out at you? For example, which one of the four C's fascinates you? Which one of the four C's scares you? Maybe kind of intimidates you the most? Please write in the chat box to let me know. Oh, I see that we have someone from Hungary. Hello, Anita. Thank you for joining us. So please write in the chat box which of the four C's fascinates you and which one maybe intimidates you, maybe scares you a little bit. I'd love to hear from you. Oh, yes, we have Zelda from Turkey. Hello, it's so good to see you. And um, so which one of these four C's? I mean, I can tell you that for me, Probably the one that gives me a certain kind of emotion is uh, creativity. Um, even though I think I'm probably the best or, or where my strengths are might be more in communication. 
Um, but I find I get excited about creativity. And then some aspects of critical thinking, I have always feel that they're quite, they're challenging. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here. Oh, we also have someone from Serbia. Hello there. Jasna, Jasna. So I have here that um, Sheila Corwin says that critical thinking fascinates her. What about the rest of you? What is it that fascinates you? And what is it? Mm, Selda says that challenges fascinate her. And I do remember that. Slavka says creativity fascinates me. And what scares me a bit is critical thinking. Yes, I, I completely understand how you feel. <laughs> it's so true. And then Anastasia says that creativity scares her. And Elisabetta says, hello, hello, Elisabetta. How are you, my dear? And um, this idea that, you know, we all have a feeling when it comes to these four C's. And I think it's really important to recognize that, that we also have, oh, hello, Elena. <laughs> so nice to see you. And we also have Gerdian from Holland. Very nice to have you here. If you're just joining us, I was asking everyone to please write in the chat box, when you hear the four C's of communication, collaboration, creativity, and critical thinking, which one of these fascinates you the most and which one of these scares you the most? Yes, Anastasia says collaboration is challenging. It is challenging because when we get into collaboration, it's not just about us and our ideas or our thoughts. Um, it's definitely uh, something where let's let's say it's less. Uh, we have the impression that it's less in our control, and teachers have a, a, really can find this challenging with other teachers. Children, our students, they can find it challenging to work together. Sometimes it's very challenging also to work in our school communities, you know, even with families. That is a collaboration. And if we have some difficulty with that, um, it's really, uh, it makes school even more challenging for us. Oh, Dragon is here. Hello, Dragon. It's so good to see you again. Yes, boy, I haven't seen you in a long time, but I feel like I see you all the time because of the fact that we're able to keep in touch on social media. So let me go on. I believe that many educators are in a kind of a crossroads. Okay, what do I mean? Now, traditionally, and, and still in many school systems across the globe, education is still kind of seen um, let's say in theory, we know that we should have our students be more active. However, in practice, we still might tend to rely on some old traditional methods where education, we see an educator as a person who transfers knowledge. They, it's a transfer of knowledge and of skills. So the teacher is seen as the expert who possesses the knowledge. You know, you studied a lot at the university. Um, you are uh, fascinated with this topic, perhaps. So we explain it. We model it. The students watch. They observe. They take notes. They read about it. They do an assignment at home. They do exercises. And then basically, in order to assess them, we ask students in lots of traditional schools to just repeat back either the knowledge or the procedure that we taught them. And we feel that that is, uh, we have somehow uh, educated successfully. Too bad that a lot of our students are kind of bored. Have you noticed? Or as the pandemic has shown us, they don't even show their faces. They don't even turn on the cameras or maybe they just don't even come to our virtual lessons. Now. While we were in the physical environment, right, you could see who's here, who's not here. And instead, with the pandemic, there has been a disruption. But I want to invite you to think about it as a positive disruption in many ways, because it has forced us, uh, it has pushed us even further outside of our more traditional teaching, given us new tools, and perhaps will help us 
come September or even tomorrow, try something new. So um, let's say, who are we even transferring knowledge to if our students aren't even turning on the microphone or their cameras or if they aren't even coming to school, right? Uh, where is it that we put all of this competence and expertise, right? How do we prepare them for a future, though, that we have not yet lived and that perhaps we will not even see, we won't even necessarily live to see? This is really quite a question. I was reading in the OECD report, a report called Learning Compass 2030, and I believe it's going to be put in the comments section of this uh, Facebook Live. And I read this quote that said, some education experts have noted that most 21st century students are still being taught by teachers using 20th century pedagogical practices in 19th century school organizations. Interesting. So my question is, in a world facing challenges such as climate change, this pandemic and perhaps future pandemics or epidemics, fake news, which is uh, fake news and even social media that are dividing people into what they call information silos, where they no longer listen to anything that they disagree with, okay? They just stay in their little uh, box and in an echo chamber. So these are really big challenges that I personally, when I was uh, going to university, could never have imagined in a million years. So we also have artificial intelligence, which is taking over many jobs. Mm, and then, so to what extent do our students need to know what is already known? That's a good question for us. And to what extent do we give them the opportunity to experience the excitement, the frustration, the confusion, the motivation that comes with grappling with totally new information, with a sudden problem, uh, with a, a multi-pronged challenge, and try to imagine different solutions. I mean, how often do we really do that? So um, what I was thinking was like many of today's educators are looking for ways out of this. And we see this at Europass all the time because we have some really uh, talented resourceful teachers that come to our school and and actually and we learn so much from their best practices as well mm, but i find that a lot of us educators find we find ourselves in this middle place where we're incorporating more active learning methods such as project-based learning or flipped classroom or the socratic method um, elements of gaming okay however these methodologies also require some training and I would, this is why the four C's is particularly interesting because um, the four C's becomes a bit more of a way of being in the classroom. So when I say we're only halfway there, think about it. Since we're kind of leaving behind <clears throat> the world of manufacturing, this world in which we needed to prepare people for work that required repetition, required memorization, we are now going forward into a world of innovation. And so machines are now carrying out a lot of these more repetitive tasks and it will happen more and more. And so um, when I say that we are in the crossroads, it's like this. So think about it. Mm, say you want to do a, you want to uh, work with your students, some type of a unit or a project on food waste, okay, on all the food that we throw away without uh, consuming. And this is something, this is a big topic, right? Okay. So think about, I want you to, re to reflect upon, like, what is the difference between standing up in front of your students or online and saying, okay, students, we are going to do a, a project on food waste. Food waste is an enormous problem because it's bad for the economy, it's bad for the environment, it's bad from a moral standpoint because there are many people who don't have enough food and then many people in the world who have too much food and 
Mm, then we also go on to explain to them that about 50% of food waste happens in our own homes. And um, then we tell them some interesting tips about how to avoid wasting food, okay? Um, then perhaps once we have done all of this, we often will then ask them to, okay, prepare a PowerPoint presentation, for example, in groups of four, perhaps without realizing that maybe they don't even know how to work well in a group of four, but that's a different thing. Or we ask them, okay, then make a poster of the dangers or of the problems with food waste. And of course, we've already told them what the problems are, so they don't really need to even try to find out. And then, and we call that creativity because they're making a poster, right? And then we ask them maybe to make like a video tutorial uh, with some of the solutions that uh, we could find to food waste. And of course, they have already looked up these solutions. Either we have told them or they just go on the internet and the first website that comes up, they just look at that and then they, you know, copy down these answers. Okay. So do you see what I mean about being kind of halfway there? A teacher might think that they are using the four C's in this case, but it's really, we are just taking one or two steps outside of the more traditional method. So what if we applied a more four C's approach to just this particular topic? Okay, communication. Well, first of all, so first off, who is communicating in this lesson? You or them? Who's getting the experience? When we impart knowledge, now this is a really cool fun fact for us teachers. Mm, when we impart knowledge and we lecture, guess whose pleasure centers in our brain, in the brain, light up? You got it, ours. Because we're talking about a topic that we like. We're talking about a topic that we know a lot about. Maybe we're kind of excited. Now, of course, that excitement is a good thing because some of that emotion can also reach the students and in some of them maybe ignite some interest, okay? But we are doing all the talking and yes, maybe they're learning something about how to listen, but they also are thinking about lots of other things. So the other thing that happens when we lecture is we are in a very comfortable position because we feel competent. Uh, we feel like the expert. Mm, we feel in control. And we might even feel powerful, okay? So um, first off, how can the four C's in this case help us frame this topic? So what if we didn't tell them anything, but we simply wrote the words food waste on the board, food waste. And then we ask the students to get into groups of four very quickly. We will think of some type of a, a way to do that. There's many different methods that you could try. Um, you could have them stand up and walk around the room and say, okay, find someone who's wearing the same color shirt as you, or find someone who has um, uh, is wearing glasses like you or is not wearing glasses or whatever, but you could, or you could even assign the groups. But you have them get into groups of four very quickly and just let them brainstorm. So brainstorm means say all of their ideas without worrying if they're right or they're wrong, if it's a good idea or a bad idea. Just the whatever words pop into their heads about food waste, okay? So they just sit there, somebody writes them all down, blah, 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 and there's just all this chatter, and you kind of are walking around the room. If you have the possibility to put them in breakout rooms on, uh, if you're working virtually, you can do that. And if you're in a hybrid where you have some students in the classroom and some at home, you can still organize it. The ones who are there present uh, physically, they can do it physically, and the ones who are um, virtual, they could go into a breakout room and do it. Now, think about um, uh, once they have finished brainstorming, then what if we ask them to use different colored pencils to classify, or if they're doing it online, they could just use the highlighter, different color fonts to classify what they have written into categories. For example, they could be categories about who or why, when, where, how, 
or you might even try a different classification like emotions, um, let's say solutions, actions, um, questions, something like that. And I say emotions because as we talk about a lot of times, um, interesting things are emotional. And when we talk about food waste, you might find that they talk about guilty, uh, sad, um, or, you know, things like satisfied, because maybe they are really uh, very good in their families about this. So do you see what's happening? We're already using all the four C's without even breaking a sweat. I mean, we're there just watching it happen. Now, I understand that your students are also going to maybe talk too much, or they might get off topic, or they might also disagree. But this is part of the experience as well. Even some of the conflict management, or even, you know, who's going to write all the ideas down. This is part of the experience. So mm, you could then ask the groups to share their collective brainstorming by either posting them on a virtual wall, like maybe using Padlet or something like that, or a physical wall in your classroom. They could then stand up, move around, look at what their other classmates have generated in their brainstorming. And they can actually go, oh, that's right, I hadn't thought about, that was a cool idea. Or, oh my God, we had the same ideas, that's amazing in this kind of like a positive contamination that can happen among students, okay? Think about it. You All you did was write the word food waste on the board and organize a good container of how to make the four C's actually happen. So now they're starting to get an appetite for this topic, okay? No pun intended, right? So instead of you deciding a narrow scope of the project, saying, we're going to talk about food waste, this is the problem with food waste, these are the percentages, and so you are then going to make a poster or you are going to make a, a PowerPoint, you first got them hungry. You got them hungry for the topic. And then you ask them how they might, you could even ask them how they see the topic of food waste as it's connected to other subjects that they study, okay? Perhaps you, teacher, you might have a light bulb or two go off because you might realize that you might have some other colleagues in that building who are interested in collaborating with you on this because this is another thing that we tend to be a bit isolated in our profession or we it's too complicated to kind of get a real collaboration going. But here, it could even just be as simple as, you know, if you are the science teacher, you going over to the history teacher and saying, hey, uh, you know, my students noticed that you were talking about, I don't know, um, uh, the, the Irish potato famine in, uh, in history. And how is it that we could somehow generate even just a conversation in class that would connect this topic? And so uh, the students start seeing the benefits of our synergy, and they also start seeing, oh, that's why we are studying these things. Then we could ask the students what happens in their community with regards to food waste. Ever think about that? I mean, I hear little snippets here and there of things that are happening in Florence, but frankly, I'm not that knowledgeable about it. But I bet a lot of my students are. Maybe their parents are involved in something, or maybe just for their own reasons they're interested. Um, I find that, especially my university students, a lot of times I, I will talk about a topic and I see them immediately, da, 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 and I'm thinking, hey, what are they doing going online? And then I realize they're actually in real time researching something that I'm talking about. So have them research what is happening in the community and discover, perhaps they could discover how these organizations are communicating their message. How effective is that message or isn't it? Have them evaluate their research in small groups to identify what is working and what is not working in these initiatives using their critical thinking. Which age group uh, am I talking about? It could be depend for, uh, I'm thinking um, this could be from late primary school all the way through. If they are younger than that, 
then it can be obviously a conversation that has more to do with what's happening in their small community, meaning at home or at school, okay? But then uh, for the students, I would say from age nine, eight or nine all through, you could develop all kinds of interesting things that are also with more community outreach. Mm -hmm. So then um, going back to what I was saying, so they could uh, also like kind of their little light bulbs start going off as well because they start seeing hmm these community based uh, initiatives huh uh, maybe the school could also connect with them cuz you know we eat lunch at school or the school you know where does the food go that we don't finish during lunchtime and they could like become more curious. They could even go down to the lunch lady and ask her, or they could contact the service that provides that caters the lunches at your school. Or you could even uh, reflect upon, mm, well, what about the food that is catered as opposed to the food that each student individually brings? Is there a difference in how much food gets wasted? But let them brainstorm possible ways to create synergy or how to even transform, how, ask them, how could we transform some habits in, in your school? Um, or how to use like different forms of communication to express uh, how, what they think is important about this message. So I'm not telling them what the message is. I'm curious to know how they might imagine it. Now that doesn't mean that they're going to have the right message or that they're going to be successful at it. Is that the point? Or do we want them to have the experience and then be able to reflect on the experience collectively to think about what was effective and what wasn't? This is the kind of skill that they will need in everything from, obviously, their work, it, they're going to need this skill in talking to their partner, even talking to their own children someday, in getting along with the people that live in their building. So as we see that uh, communication is much more than standing in the front of the classroom for the students, I mean, when the students, uh, it's very typical in Italy, for example, that students, in order to show their competence, their oracy, their oral competence, they actually stand up in the front of the classroom and often need to just talk a lot of times repeating back what it is that they have learned. So let's think about that though. How much, how all these opportunities, here I am, I am speaking to an international audience through a little webcam on my screen. I don't see you, but I know you're there. And so in some way, I need to think about, first of all, that we are using English as our common language. I need to be aware of the volume that, I'm, that I have in my voice. I need to be aware of the tone. I need to be aware of the pace. I can't be too fast or too slow. I need to use terms that also non-native speakers can easily understand. So I become aware, aware of vocabulary. I become aware of grammar. Mm, I become aware of my syntax. This is also really interesting when we talk, when we think about um, communication and artificial intelligence. How many of you talk to, you know, your um, electronic devices when you use Siri, when you use Alexa? I can't say it too loud because she's going to talk to me now. The syntax that we need to use, the awareness that we need to have, these are really interesting things to like to practice and think about. So we can give them choices about their communication. You know, we often say, okay, you make a, make a presentation. And I, I think, well, why a presentation? But why not? You know, let's think about it. Maybe we could ask them, what channels are used to, um, in communication as a message? As a matter of fact, I would love it if you would write in the chat box what, for example, are your students' favorite social media um, apps? What do they love to use in their free time? What is one of their favorite social media apps to use? Um, because it's, it's a little different in each country, and I'd be curious to know. 
Um, I know that like TikTok is really exploding. <laughs> That's something that right now is really used. And so maybe even having them reflect on, okay, we said a PowerPoint presentation, but um, what other channels could be used? We could even ask them without us really knowing the answer, but just talk to them about what is the difference between using TikTok or Instagram or YouTube or, or, or even going and seeing an art installation, seeing a photography exhibit, listening to a song, or even watching a TED talk. Like what happens communication-wise? What, ha what, what gets communicated and in what way? Do we ever ask them that? But these are the tools that they're going to be, they're already using. Um, and what about what they put on their social media? Uh, have we uh, asked them to reflect upon, you know, that our social media with our digital footprint, right? And that it and we'll never get rid of it. And, um, you know, that more in, that, that in the United States, uh, like 98% uh, of job recruiters and human resource people say, the first thing they do is go look at people's social media account to see what it's like. And there, I read a statistic of about 68% of these same human resource people have said that they have eliminated potential candidates from job selection just based on what they found on social media. So this is another aspect of their communication. So another thought, have them reflect also, not just read about, but reflect on what is the difference between indoctrination Propaganda, persuasion, debate, or storytelling. It's fascinating, but not just to so they would get the right answer on, you know, a, a, on their native language test, but to actually read a message and think about it, and then also choose what vehicle they want to use. Then we come, oh, I'm seeing some of your messages. Snapchat, yes, Snapchat is not that big in Italy. It's huge in the United States. And I'm seeing that some of, for some of you, wow, that's interesting that Snapchat is really used in Poland. Um, I find that here in Italy, uh, students, uh, they generally, there's a lot of uh, Instagram and uh, TikTok. Facebook is, that's where the old folks go to die. Yeah, they don't really, uh, Facebook is very uncool for um, for young people. And um, okay, so then let's move on to create to collaboration. Okay, so collaboration. Anytime you ask the students to think or to reflect on something, an open question, you could give them some time individually and then you just make sure that you plan in your lesson plan those extra three or four minutes to have them just turn their chair around and share their reflection with another person. And the other person does not necessarily need to comment on it. They could, but the idea is that they would hear the other person's reflections as well, once again, as that kind of positive contamination that happens. Hmm. You get them used to sharing because in today's workplace, guess what you do? Most of the time, there's a lot of trying to problem solve uh, collectively, sparking new thoughts. And also when we listen to another person's reflection, we are obviously practicing our active listening. We are also listening perhaps with empathy because it doesn't mean that, uh, because there's a lot of communication that also expresses some emotion about it. Creativity, ha <laughs> ha, what we, a lot of us said that we really liked. So first off, ask yourself, what kinds of preconceived notions do I have in my head about creativity? Like when I hear the word creativity, do I automatically say, oh, I'm not very creative? When in fact, perhaps you are just not necessarily that good at drawing, but that is somehow in your head, you are, uh, thinking of creativity equals artistry. And you, without realizing it, you are bringing this kind of mindset into the classroom when you are hoping to encourage creativity in your students. 
So are you closing them off to their own creativity by, for example, which I have seen done many times and I am I have been guilty of this myself, where you would make an example, like a prototype of an artistic activity uh, that you found on Pinterest. And then like you buy all the supplies and then you show them step-by-step step how to make it and you call that creativity? You are doing all the work. Or should I say the person who uploaded it on Pinterest did all the work. So that is a manual activity perhaps that could have some purpose. They learn how to use glue and a glue gun or they, you know, learn how to cut better or they, but it's not necessarily to be confused with a creative activity. So we need to get that straight in our heads. So you are creative every time you repurpose an object. Every time you find a different way to do a task, maybe you find, you're, maybe you're very good at um, time management, right? And you find all these really cool ways to uh, save time in cooking or uh, to, you know, you've got some really cool solution on how you get your food shopping done in the supermarket because you have like this whole uh, strategy. And these are actually ways where you're expressing your creativity. Maybe you express your creativity in the way that you dress, um, that you're trying to somehow uh, express something with it. Maybe you also are expressing your creativity when you um, are very good at solving a problem in your, uh, your family budget. Okay. And so let's, we have to open up our minds to what creativity really is. You know what the enemies of creativity are? Routine. We talked about that last week where rituals and routine were different things, right? Routine is like without thinking and a huge, huge obstacle to creativity is quick judgment, okay? Do something and then, uh, you know, when an adult uh, goes up to a child who's happily drawing and then the, uh, and and the, maybe the, the adult says something like, well, the sun isn't green, right? Or uh, you have, you know, coloring in the lines or even things like um, attributing meaning to something that a child has produced, like saying, oh, is, is that a house? Oh, look at that house with a little fox in the and maybe that's not really where they were going. There's are small things, but they send a message. So another huge problem and obstacle in creativity is black and white thinking, right or wrong. Uh, there's a place for that in education, absolutely. But we need to be aware of when and why and how we want to foster creativity. And according to the uh, late Sir Ken Robinson, who has that, he, he, if you want to uh, look up some of his talks on creativity, he was quite, um, let's say, critical of today's schools and said that a lot of schools kill creativity. And I would invite, I would invite you to go see why he thinks that. So getting back to our food waste, students can use their creativity by thinking up new solutions to the school's food waste problem. They can imagine new ways of using leftover food. They can make uh, like a photography exhibit of what happens when food gets wasted or even, I don't know, they could create a public service message um, that they could use even in the greater community to encourage others, uh, for example, and how to use their food. Or I was even thinking maybe they could write up some recipes that would encourage people to find new ways to use leftover food. Um, uh, there's a, a chef that I follow on Facebook, uh, Jacques Pepin. I don't know if any of you ever follow him. And the thing I adore about this man, apart from his demeanor and the way he talks to people and the way he makes everyone feel so warm and safe, especially in these crazy times, but he uses very simple things. He uses leftovers. It's nothing fancy. It's, you know, that can of beans that you have had sitting in your, uh, on that shelf for about a year. Um, and he finds new ways to use it. And it's a very creative process. So mm, then we go on to critical thinking once again. And now critical thinking is often the step that accompanies creativity. 
it, it often follows creativity, um, in, but they are absolutely linked. So creativity, um, you know, thinks of the idea and critical thinking helps us plan it, helps us plan out the logical steps that we can take. It helps us look and evaluate and analyze what has already been done and what needs to be done. Okay, this is a form of problem solving. So you see where creativity and critical thinking are so linked together. Mm, and then there's the, uh, the critical thinking could also be the part that analyzes uh, how, how it's communicated in the community. Um, they could take surveys, uh, they could compile data, and then they go back into the creativity mode to then imagine new and better practices based on the information that they now have. I mean, think, I mean, we need this. This is what we need. We need people who know how to do these things and who have experienced them over and over that it's just natural for them. And you know what one of the biggest benefits of all of this is? Is how it makes you feel so unbelievably alive and motivated. I mean, please, write in the chat box. What ideas are popping into your head right now as we speak? Just even thinking about food waste, okay? This was just one of a kajillion different examples that I could have used. What is popping into your head about your subject? If you teach science, how could you connect it? If you teach history, how could you connect it? If you teach maths, how could you connect it? If you teach um, something even like uh, your native language or geography, how could you connect it? And as I was thinking about this talk for today, let me see if anyone's answering me about what ideas are popping in your head because I love hearing about this. Hmm. I'm waiting to see. So as I was thinking about this talk for today, I found that at a certain point, I couldn't, okay, I was gathering information, thinking about what I wanted to talk about. And that take, took a while. I was reading different things. I was looking at what I've talked about in past talks. I was looking at some old presentations of mine. And that's the longest part, right? Where you're kind of gathering information. And then at a certain point, I got an idea and I was sitting here with a plate of spaghetti in front of me, I swear to God. And my computer was on and I actually left the spaghetti and I started typing because I got an idea and I didn't want to lose it. Right. And then what happened was I ate the spaghetti and then I went back and I, I kind of like all of a sudden, boom, 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 boom. It was like popcorn, you know, popcorn's popping. And I, I couldn't stop imagining and writing and it was going kind of fast. And I got this like really excited feeling in my stomach do you know what I mean? This kind of like excited feeling um, of, uh, I don't know, energy, enthusiasm, maybe even almost like a, like a little nervous even because it was a part of me that was coming out. You feel a little bit vulnerable, but also a little bit excited thinking, oh, I hope that, you know, this is, uh, that this will be clear, or I hope that this is helpful, or, uh, you know, oh, I should have taken the time to look up this other thing, but I felt excited. I felt engaged. And imagine if we could, with the four C's, create that feeling, even if it was just once a week in our students. They need this. They need to feel. One enormous problem right now is that we are so focused on safety and security that we are forgetting about what it means and what it is that makes us come alive. So let's give this energy to our students and give it to ourselves. It will help propel us forward towards the challenges that we face in this exciting, scary world that we are going towards. Let me see if anyone's written anything to me. Yes, Sheila's thinking about what we can bring into the classroom and where we can take our students. Yes. And like I said, any of you who are watching and you want to add, like what ideas are popping in your head, 
please share them in that wonderful positive contamination that we have going here at the Europass Teacher Academy. Now, if you want to know more about the four C's, because this is just like one possible little corner of it. If you want to know more, um, you can find, uh, we also, we have plenty of online courses and face-to-face -face courses that uh, some of them are very specifically about the four C's. We've got um, the four C's in foreign language learning. We've got the four C's in art. Um, I have a course that's more about the four C's kind of generally uh, across all kinds of curriculum and subjects. And then, of course, we have a lot of other courses that would be a bit more specific about, you know, flipped classroom or project-based learning or gaming. Um, and these are all ways, let's say that these are all aspects of the four C's. And so I want to thank you so much for joining me and invite you next week. We are going to have the brilliant Professor Kostas Petridis from the Hellenic Mediterranean University in Greece, who is going to join me in an interview. He is a, a time management uh, expert. Uh, let's say he gives great talks about time management that I never fail to find fascinating, funny, um, and, and useful. And so I hope you'll join me next week on Europass uh, Teacher Talks. And I Hope you have a fantastic weekend. I'll see you real soon.